maybe I'll just pick up on a, a couple of those. Um, worrying about what can and what could have happened. Um, one of the things that we find in the literature is that, is that if it's really difficult for people to be connected in the present, often they will think about, well, what things were like in the past. Or they'll think about projecting themselves into the future. And I suppose one of the things that we, we will talk about a bit later on is one of the key ways to well-being is to encourage people to try to connect with that present moment a little bit more, um, particularly the positive aspects of their pleasant, positive experience in, experienced in the here and now rather than constantly going to the past or, or to the future. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was this idea around um, fear and information. And this kind of um, one example is that fear of going into new buildings. And you may have found that. Um, no matter what kind of information that you present around building safety, uh, around engineers' reports, sometimes it can feel really difficult to have that conversation around, well, is it okay or is it not okay to be in this space? Now, fear has interesting effects upon how people process information. You know, it makes them only pro pay attention to the bits that they are concerned about. So if there's any kind of risk that's there, it can get easily expanded in that person's mind. And if that's the situation that's occurring, it can be very frustrating because you keep presenting the information in lots and lots of different forms, but it keeps getting batted back. And that's, that's kind of like a conversation that's, I would probably argue, is futile. If you're going to get into that conversation where it's constantly being batted back to you, perhaps one other approach would be, how is this working for you at the moment in terms of how it's shaping your life? You know, what are the sorts of things that you're not able to do that you were able to do before? And perhaps helping them to notice how it is that it's starting to limit their lives, um, not just in the workplace. But again, that's something that perhaps is best addressed within a, an EAP kind of environment, um, but it's something that certainly could be introduced. But I, I would suggest that my, my point here is that getting into that batting of giving them more information, just having it bat batted back to you is frustrating for everyone. Totally recognise that. Although I think also some people brought up that having engineers coming and discussing the reports um, is probably quite helpful because I think it's actually giving the facts, not relaying it yeah. second hand when the person who's relaying it doesn't actually know or understand in enough detail. And I think it's about clear communication. Can help as well, can't it? Absolutely, and credibility yeah. too. Mm. You know, if you've got somebody there who's actually accountable for the information that they're, they're going to give you, then that, that can make a difference too. The common persisting themes are fatigue, Tiredness. I think that's major, and it's a different kind of tiredness. It's not just because of lack of sleep. It's because of living with, in a state of heightened stress, that your body is physically kind of prepared and has constantly been keeping going, keeping going, and you, as a result, you feel physically tired. Sometimes your legs and your muscles physically ache as a result of that. You're not imagining that. It's, it's very common. And again, again, it's um, probably the most prominent symptom across Canterbury. This feeling despondent and overwhelmed, they're constantly trying to think your way out of a problem that you can't think your way out of, um, that's very common. Uncertainty about the future, um, but not particularly about are there going to be more life-threatening uh, earthquakes, more about what's going to happen, you know, are things going to be rebuilt, what's the city going to look like, what's my job going to look like, things like that. Feelings of anger and frustration and generally a lowered tolerance to everything. And I think in the workplace we see this a lot, that little things become massive. And you think, how did that become so big? But I think everyone just fires off really easily. So it's being very aware of that and trying to be much more tolerant than you've been before. The sense of fear that I talked about and, and Saab's talked about. Poor concentration. When we were writing this slide, we were making sure that we'd included everything that you'd... Um, included and uh, I said oh well, have we got everything Sabi says you're missing concentration Caroline I went that'll be right we're missing concentration I mean it's really major I mean I feel like half the time I don't finish sentences and I'm communicating with people and you just keep going off onto something else and I think we're all doing that a lot oh that's my defense for it um, and this almost a paralysis um, that people are feeling of waiting and waiting and waiting. You know, how do you deal with that? Constantly waiting for someone to tell you something that is going to have a huge impact on your life and things being delayed and you having absolutely no control of that. And it, it does make you feel that 
I, I think it is almost, it's certainly a psychological paralysis, but almost physically. You know, I just can't do anything. Um, interpersonal and relationship issues, I mean, because of all that, you can imagine that being played out between particularly um, partnerships at home, you know, that little things become big, particularly perhaps if you've been holding it together at work and then you get home and it fires up, but vice versa, if there are stresses at home and you're kind of pushing it all down at home, it can play out at work as well. Substance abuse and, and also use, uh, I think our use of alcohol, um, even if it doesn't tip into abuse, has probably increased. Um, and I think that happened after the earthquakes almost immediately, um, that we were all having a drink of wine when we got home from work, something like that. Um, and I, I, I talked about this before. There was a great Twitter really early on that, just, that said, uh, I'm just moving the alcohol so it's in reach of the door frame. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that would be good. And I, I know my supermarket in Redcliffs after the September earthquake, when I went in there, there was no wine. And I said to the manager, um, obviously because I was trying to buy some wine, I said, where's all the wine? And he goes, I said, did it all get smashed? He went, no, nope, just sold it. <laughs> but, we, uh, but joking apart, we really need to watch that. Um, because it's a very easy, slippery slope to get into. And I think it's really important that you kind of put parameters around that and having like two or three nights a week where you don't have anything to drink, something like that, um, and being quite strict with yourself. And it's a bit like I was saying before, we really need to work on this well-being thing, that actually we really, really need to put things in place that weren't there before, just really think about it. Yeah, just to add to that around the lower tolerance, <clears throat> exactly what Caroline was saying. So if you can imagine you've perhaps got this kind of little, this headroom in your normal life where you can uh, absorb the daily sort of like strains and stresses that you go through. As you kind of go through this period of perhaps not getting enough sleep, perhaps not exercising as much as you would normally do, perhaps not eating as much as uh, good stuff as you would normally do, eating more bad stuff than you would normally do, your kind of adaptive capacity headroom starts to shrink. So every time you get those daily stresses and strain, they kind of go above your level for being able to absorb that. And then that's where your feelings of frustration and anger and intolerance for those events or people who seem to be provoking this reaction in you starts to show itself. So one of the things that Caroline just mentioned is that you really have to work at trying to increase that adaptive capacity, <coughs> particularly in, in the space where you're going to keep getting these ongoing stresses and strains either through the earthquakes or wrestling with EQC or all the other practical stuff that you're trying to do in your life, even if you just take it at that level, it's really important to, to understand how your well-being and looking after yourself helps you to increase that adaptive capacity so it doesn't feel like you're being breached all the time by all these daily events that are coming to assault you. Resilience is this kind of idea that um, we're able to kind of bounce back from events and, and they don't tend to disturb us too much. So, but I think it's better to think of it as a dynamic equilibrium. You know, people will have ups and downs along the way, but they don't deviate too far away from where they would normally like to be and normally are able to kind of function. Um, for other people, you may have a much bigger dip in terms of um, how it is that they're coping with events that are, that are happening in their lives uh, and then a gradual return back to something around where they were, or even for some people, they have this growth. Uh, and at a community level as well, you can get that growth too. Um, the trick is trying to identify who are those people who perhaps aren't getting back to where they were as quickly as they would like to be. Um, and Caroline um, will talk through a couple of slides. We'll, we'll get to those sorts of warning signs. Um, what is resilience? And that, that's a huge question, and um, I wish we had the answer for that, and I wish it was something we could kind of put in the water and we all have it instantly. Um, now, Saab yesterday was talking about this metaphor. Metaphors are great, I think, because when you have images for things, they're really powerful, and he talked about this one about a sandstorm, and I thought that was really apt for us, um, that a sandstorm, you're in the desert, and a, a sandstorm happens, and it was completely unpredictable, like the earthquakes. And what you do, you kind of physically hunker down uh, and sort of curl over and protect yourself and those you love um, and let the sandstorm pass. And then you get up from the sandstorm and things have moved. The dunes weren't where they were, they're reshaped. 
And then the, I've added this, I've added this bit, that actually then you're walking on sand, you know, and so your feet are just sinking and you can't move forward. And it feels like you don't know where you're going and every step you take is really hard. And I think that's a really good metaphor for what we've um, been experiencing. It sort of sums up my, my experience of the past 18 months, really. But it's then finding a new direction out um, that you can manage. And it is still going to be hard because you're walking on sand and your seat, feet are sinking. But you can find a way through from that. And what I'm trying to emphasize with that is resilience isn't that everything's fine. It's not that the Cantabrians have just withstood this huge onslaught and been absolutely fine. That we haven't. We've all really struggled. We've all not been sleeping. We've been jumping. We've been worrying. We've been feeling miserable. Why, this is really, why has this happened to me? All that. That's not absolutely fine. That's kind of bending but still kind of functioning. And then that we bend back and then other things happen and we bend some more, but then we bend back and we're still functioning, but we're not this brittle, resilient, sort of King Canute wall that is trying to stop this wave and just a sort of kind of wall around us. That we, ha we are flexible and we've bent with things and we're bending back again. And sometimes it feels like we've almost snapped over, but other times we are moving and more flexible. But we've had difficulties, you know, we've not been, um, we've not felt nothing from this. And I think lots of people have said, oh, we're really fed up with hearing the word resilient. Um, but I think it's because it's not really understanding what resilient means. It is this bendableness, this flexibleness. Um, it's not this brittle, rigid wall. And what we want to do is kind of help build resilience. And so understanding what makes people resilient will be a way we could perhaps do that because we know that resiliency, there may be some inbornness to it, some innate tendencies that make people generally more resilient. But we also know that resilience can also be learned, that you can do things that build up your resilience. Um, and a bit like this analogy of a blade of grass blowing over and blowing back again, it kind of depends on how rooted it is, that, you know, where the roots go, they're sort of far-fetched underneath, how connected you are, how things you are doing that strengthen that underneathness of you, that means that you can bend and come back. I think that's quite a helpful way of thinking about it. And we're going to move on to think about ways that you can build that resilience. And that's not to deny that you can't still taste the sand. You can't still feel it in your feet in your shoes as you walk along. It's not to deny that um, you know that another sandstorm is going to come. It's not there right now, but you know it's going to come. But at night, even though the dunes have shifted and you can't tell where you are compared to where you were before, the stars come out. And you can see that the stars haven't changed. And those are your values and what's important in your life, and what is important for what your family's goals are. And you may need to change your position to make sure that you're aligned again and to get yourself right. But you know that you'll still, even on a cloudy night, get glimpses of those. And sometimes you'll see more of them than others, but you know that they're there. So that's, an, that's a, again, a nice way of thinking about what our values are and how they can help to orient us in these shifting and changing times of uncertainty. Someone brought up in the break, and... Um, we hadn't quite got to this, that I, I think we need to recognise that there are going to be people who we're working with, who are our friends, who are our colleagues, who really aren't coping, that there is a difference um, from this kind of bending stuff and sort of functioning and finding a way through that most people are doing, where some people, and it is a minority, are not coping. And it's trying to identify those people. And there's no magic survey that you could do that says, OK, that person needs help, but these are the kind of warning signs that you might hear from your other managers, from people in the workplace. And it's people who are kind of persistently low in their mood, losing hope, um, very pessimistic, suicidal, of course, needs intervention. People who are persistently ruminating, really not letting it be able, being able to let go of that, those thinking patterns that Saab was talking about and getting consumed by that way of thinking. People who are very anxious, very hyper-aroused, very avoidant, um, they're warning signs again. 
And people presenting with significant relationship or domestic violence issues, there's more of that coming out. And people de developing frank alcohol or drug problems. So not just at, you know, a, drinking within normal um, limits, but much more than that. And that's slipping into a, an area that does need intervention. Next slide. So, because we do know that a small percentage of people, and it's again difficult to put a precise number on that, but probably five or ten percent, may develop significant mental health problems. And these are in the realm of depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder. And we can't assume that because the earthquake happened, you know, over a year ago that these problems would have come out by now. That isn't how things tend to happen. There tends to be a delay, and then they come more to the fore. So, you know, it is more now that these issues are going to be more obvious. And it may be that, you know, there's more of a separation from people who are doing this up and downness, but kind of functioning to the people who are just down here. And they're, they're going to have fluctuations, but they're, not, they're really not coming back to that level of normal functioning that we're kind of accepting as normal for now. Yeah, just to emphasise that, um, we were doing some research last month and we we're having conversations with people about where they are now and as soon as they hear anything to do with the earthquake, what they want to tell us is what was going on on the day for them. Um, and that, for me, is quite an indicator that people are very generally still processing this event. You know, they're not in a position where they're kind of like, and we're beyond this now and it, all the stuff that we're going to have to go through is behind us. They're still right in the middle of it. So you can still s expect to see some things, some problems, some issues that perhaps weren't there before could still pop up. We're not in that period yet where we're thinking, OK, so perhaps most of the stuff that's going to show itself has done. We're not there yet. People aren't. And another thing is people um, may not recognise it in themselves and they say things like, I haven't had it as bad as some people. I haven't lost my house. I haven't lost someone. I'm, I shouldn't be feeling like that. That's irrelevant. You know, what you've lost uh, it does, is not what determines how you are now. So it's really trying to emphasize that there is help available, um, and these will be the ways that you can get it. We're great at that. We're great at pointing, you know, saying, you know, there are other people in greater need than me, and we have this idea in our mind that there is a limited amount of resource, and really you should be going to them rather than me. I'll struggle through it, I'll get on. And what we need to do is to perhaps make it okay for people to say, you know, maybe a little bit, struggling a little bit, you know, I don't want to kind of hog the resources, but making people feel okay to do that. And what we want to do is to make sure that just because we don't hear from people, it doesn't mean that everything's okay. You know, well, perhaps we need to be a little bit smarter, a little bit wiser around how we ask those difficult questions and, just, and checking in with people as to how they're doing. So we've talked about these issues of so fatigue and cognitive wear cognitive wear weariness, not weariness, weariness, being just tired, can't be bothered to go the extra mile. Um, I'm going to know if someone gives me something to read, I kind of think, oh, I don't want to read anything else, I'm just exhausted, you know, um, and it's really trying to sort of gear yourself up to do a bit more. Um, emotionally exhausted, feeling quite labile in your mood, I and mean, we probably have more tears at work, you know, than I've ever seen, um, and it's settling down now, but little things just set things off, like the office being rearranged, you know, for the umpteenth time, you know, and people say, well, that, I just thought that was my space, and then it's gone again. Um, irritability interpersonally, you know, with it in the workplace, like I talked about, big things becoming big very quickly. Um, absenteeism, but probably more prevalent presenteeism, people who are continuing to come to work when um, perhaps they shouldn't, staying longer hours, feeling that they're not doing a good enough job, feeling that they have to complete everything on the unachievable list, but constantly feeling driven to be like that, and it almost getting into diminishing returns, that you're just being much less productive. Um, and someone was talking to me about burnout, you know, what that looks like. Um, and, it, and it is these things being much more present, that you just people have lost their spontaneity, everything is a big deal, the response for asking someone to do something blows up, and it's just not how that person was, and they're not getting joy or pleasure out of things anymore. And I'm not saying we're all skipping through our work every day, but you know, you've got to get something out of it. You've got to enjoy some of it. Otherwise, it just becomes a huge, draining, stressing chore, um, which is not sustainable, actually. 
I think people are starting to pick this up for themselves as well. You know, and one of the things that really keep people engaged at work is that getting that meaning. You know, what is it that I'm trying to do here as my, in my role? What does this organisation stand for? And I know, I've, I know people are having conversations with themselves and their families of, do I need this in my life at the moment? You know, should I be doing something that's perhaps a little bit less stressful, something that's probably something I can perhaps take and leave and just show up and do because all of this stuff, this fatigue and cognitive weariness, it's affecting my performance and it's making me feel bad at work and I know that I feel like I'm going through the motions. So then people are, not just yourselves as employers, I know that employees are also noticing this and it's, it's making them think, well, what do I do to help myself in this situation? So I think in those sorts of situations, one of the things that can be helpful is rotation. And I know that a lot of you have helped um, try those things out. You're taking people out of perhaps high client load tasks for a wee while, um, just to freshen them up. I know that sometimes um, people have had focus days. So it's like, actually, we're all, as a team, going to focus upon this particular issue. And we're going to do this for a day or a week. And everything else that's kind of going on top of us, we're going to set aside for this day. And that helps to provide you know, that meaning, that engagement around a particular issue, start bringing teams together around that, and then that can carry people along with that. And if that's revisited every now and again as a team and as an organisation, you can start injecting those little bits of meaning and passion and joy again. But we'll talk about some of those things.